This is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with author Farah Nayeri about her new book, Takedown, Art and Power in the Digital Age. In the book, Nayeri, a longtime culture journalist for the New York Times, addresses some of the art world's most prickly topics. Issues such as gender bias, underrepresentation, censorship, and cultural appropriation are examined in the context of a more connected world that has become passionate about issues of equality. Now, my conversation about power in the art world with Farah Nayeri. Farah Nayeri, thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast to talk about your new book, Takedown, Art and Power in the Digital Age. Farah, where do you even start to uh, describe your book to folks when they ask about <laughs> what, what, what did you write? Yeah, Craig, thank you very much for having me on your show. It's a great pleasure to be on. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of topics uh, t- touched upon in the book, but I suppose what one could say is that it's, um, it's about uh, power dynamics in the world of art and museums and how those power, dy- power dynamics have completely shifted uh, across the ages. Uh, and in fact, they've shifted really very recently. We went for centuries um, uh, with, you know, a kind of like a system whereby you had top-down censorship and top-down control of art. Artists had to be sort of careful because they were answerable to patrons who were either princes or popes or nobility or queens or uh, in the 20th century, you know, dictatorships. You had one party states like the, like Germany um, and like uh, the Soviet Union. And so artists were really not um, free. Um, nowadays, artists are free, very free than, you know, free as can be. Uh, however, there's a new kind of control or uh, scrutiny that they've come under, and that is the control of the general public, of um, people like you and me, uh, people who have the vote and people who also have access, free and open access to um, what's called social media. And so that, that I'm sort of basically describing that trajectory, but mainly focusing on contemporary and modern times. I mean, the the chapters about art history and and the you know distant past, it, it, you know, I've compressed it into one chapter. So just to reassure readers, this is all about now, and it's all about today, and it's all about controversies that have broken out in recent years over art. I feel like a, a certain amount of your your book looks at comparative cultures between U.S., Britain, France. You know, you I feel like you have a really unique perspective, having grown up in your formative years in France work for U.S. organizations for, for decades, live in London. Uh, but tell me, you know, you know, based on what you were saying in terms of uh, how that power structure is looking a little bit different, can you tell me how you see the power dynamics a little different in museums in the U.S. versus uh, the U.K. Uh, in regards to where the majority of funding comes from? Because I think part of things being capable of changing a, a certain degree of what we see in museums is related here in the U.S. to who's on the board, right? And who is giving right. the money. Right. A, a lot of this comes down to where's the money? Where's the money coming from? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, the difference here is that, you know, I, I live in the U.K., I live in London, and I'm frequently in Paris. But um the difference, the fundamental difference is that taxpayers uh, fund uh, museums in this country, in the UK. And most of the funding uh, in most institutions comes from the taxpayer. And then these institutions go out and fundraise and make money. So it's a sort of mixed model. But basically, I mean, if it weren't for taxpayers, a lot of these museums wouldn't be able to stay open. I mean, they get tens of millions of pounds or dollars a year, if not, you know, reaching into a um, hundred million, maybe. I, I'm not sure that, that any museum gets hundred million or more a year, but certainly tens of millions, you know, the big national museums, they receive that from the taxpayer. 
And um, in America, of course, uh, that's not the case. So whereas here you really do also need private funding, you do need the sponsors and you do need the billionaires on board to pay for your big um, expansions and your capital projects and put tens of millions on the table for you to be able to build that new wing, you're not kind of like beholden only to private money. Whereas in America, um, you know, uh, unfortunately that is the case. In other words, you really do need private money and private funding to stay afloat. And that, of course, changes the dynamics quite a bit because um, this is, you know, the UK is a, is a democracy, is a Western democracy, a thriving democracy. And so, you know, even though the taxpayer or the government funds these uh, museums, they're not going to tell them what to do. The government's not going to step in, you know, uh, and say, well, you should put on this exhibition and you should not put on that exhibition. Whereas, you know, and, and, um, and of course, that's also the case naturally in the United States of America. But if all of your funding is coming from private sources, and those private sources may be uncomfortable about some exhibition you're going to put on, which not which is not going to kind of make them look good in some way, shape, or form. There is the potentiality of, you know, that board member or that very well endowed individual kind of breathing down the neck of the museum's management. So, yeah, that that's where the dynamics differ. You know, one of the things that I've read about with board members that I didn't see you talk about in, in the book, but I think it's an issue is, you know, board's influence on what art, you know, specific pieces getting exhibited. The, the uh, uh, board members exerting their power to increase the value of the works in their own portfolio. Right. So the ability of a, of a board member to, yeah, yeah. to no, you know, yeah. say, you know, hey, I, I think it'd be a great idea if, you know, my personal piece were part of this exhibit because that adds uh, gravitas to their resume. Right. Let me stop you there. I mean, I have spoken, obviously, I'm constant in touch with people who put on exhibitions. And um, what they are very clear about is that you don't have board members actually saying, you know, I want my piece in your show. That's not the way it happens because that would be really, that would be pretty bad. I mean, that, that, that really would be conflict of interest. And that's something that, you know, I think, um, I mean, really, I don't think it's, it's something that happens uh, like so broadly and openly as you, as you and I just described it. But what, what can happen is that when you're sitting around the table and there's board members and they're all sitting around the table and there are pitches that come from the museum's curators as to what exhibitions we should put on, that you can have board members actually approve, you know, or encourage an exhibition in which that they, in which they can show works from their own collection or in which they, uh, they can show works by an artist that they own. Of course, as soon as an artist's work goes into a big museum, clearly the value and the worth of that artist goes up. So there is that kind of, there is that situation, which you don't have when, when your um, museum is government funded. Well, the other side of this whole coin is not only work that these donors may not be comfortable with, we're now in a new cycle where we're talking about museums not being comfortable with who the donors are anymore. Um, and maybe right. when we just knew a family for being uh, wealthy and not necessarily knowing where that money came from, now we're talking about new cycles where, oh, your your wealth came from riot gear that's being used by oppressive police forces or, you know, your right. your family is the one that actually is responsible for the opioid epidemic. The tables are, are turning a little bit there and your chapter six, all all money is dirty <laughs> you know, kind of illuminated that. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, the story of Nan Golden and your your conversation with her? You you also have a podcast, which is amazing. I do, And yeah. what, what, <laughs> remind my listeners the, the name of your podcast. My podcast is called Culture Blast, all one word, and it's on all platforms. I listened to your conversation with Nan Golden this week. Can you kind of tell Nan's story as it relates to trying to fight that uh, power structure? Sure. I mean, Nan um, had, uh, the way she described it to me, and she, she's described it everywhere, she had, I believe, a wrist operation in Germany uh, a number of years ago. And so, you know, after the wrist operation, she had extraordinary amounts of pain. 
And um, the doctor there gave her this painkiller and said, look, you can take this. But of course, it was prescribed in, in, in small, small doses. And she took doses that were even smaller in the beginning. You know, she was just, um, you know, and then after a while, I believe, well, obviously, you know, she started wanting to take this drug more because, of course, as we know, it was OxyContin and it's, it's addictive. And so she started asking the doctor in Germany for more and more uh, prescriptions to, to get more of that drug and then eventually uh, moved to New York and found herself there again needing to use this drug and not being able to get it easily. So, you know, it was just a, a matter of trying to get prescriptions through certain ways. And eventually she found herself addicted to it and um, and went through a horrendous time. I think it was a very, very, very dark time. I think there was... She described it as being, um, you know, close to death. I mean, it really was a very, very rough period in her life. And she had, as she describes to me on the podcast and in the book, because she also speaks to me in the book, um, you know, she had the money and, and the ability to go and, and go to rehab and, and work herself out of this, which she did. She went to rehab and she survived, thankfully. And uh, we're all very happy to have Nan with us today. Because then what happened is that she picks up a copy of The New Yorker and sees this uh, article by Patrick Radden Keefe describing, I mean, basically connecting OxyContin with the Sacklers, the Sackler family whose name she's seen on museums everywhere. Everywhere you go, there's a Sackler wing. And uh, so she decides to go after the Sacklers right there and then. She makes that decision. And she says, I'm going to go after these people and I'm going to basically shame them uh, in exactly the place where they seek the most honor and recognition, meaning in the museum world. And so she determines to basically get the name Sackler taken down from a number of museums. Her most spectacular action, as you know, was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where she burst into the Temple of Dendur, that Egyptian temple that was transported and brought all the way over into the Metropolitan Museum and paid for by Arthur Sackler, so she shows up with dozens of her um, cohorts in, in her group, which is called Pain, P-A-I-N. And they start throwing, you know, pill bottles into this pool around the Temple of Dendur. And then they have a die-in. They pretend to die and they collapse on the floor of the, the mat. And of course, so that got masses of media attention. And from there, she went and did the same sort of thing at the Guggenheim. And then she went to the Louvre and outside the pyramid. There was another action that was uh, widely covered. And then she kind of put pressure on museums everywhere uh, that had the Sackler name prominently, you know, featured on their walls. And so um, through that whole process, um, which she sort of describes in my podcast and, you know, very eloquently, uh, she reached a point where now we basically finally reached the point where uh, the Metropolitan Museum has, is taking the Sackler name down. So is the Serpentine Gallery, which is around the corner from where I live here in London. They had a new wing called the Serpentine Sackler Gallery. It's now called the North Gallery. And so the name Sackler is basically tumbling off everywhere. And this extraordinary woman, um, you know, has together with some very, you know, uh, diligent journalists managed to, um, you know, to, to, to make a, huge huge difference absolutely and you know again i would encourage um my listeners to to go check out your your podcast culture blast that interview with nan golden you know and i it was so well done i i felt like i really it really changed my perception of who she was as an artist uh, because I think I had always kind of lumped you. her in. Thank you, Craig. I felt like I always kind of lumped her in as being someone who was really kind of focused on shock value, and you know, right. your your questions where where the conversation led really kind of gave her story a more human element than than I was anticipating. She's someone incredibly incredibly humane and and just incredibly sincere. I guess it was uh, three years ago, you wrote an article about Gauguin, and uh, you, it sounds like you woke up to learn that the, the headline writer at the Times had chosen uh, the headline, Is It Time Gauguin Got Canceled? Which it, it, it seemed like folks 
wanted to cancel you in response to that headline. <laughs> and so can you, <laughs> can you tell us about yeah. um, the, the problematic nature with Gauguin and kind of how the world is, you know, trying to grapple with uh, the issue of the man versus the art and how do we deal with problematic people whose work we have historically respected, but now when we put a microscope to their lives, it's really hard to appreciate the person? Yeah, I mean, first of all, to be fair to my editor, um, he was basically riffing off some a line that was in the audio guide to that exhibition. In the audio guide, there was a voice that said, is it time we stop looking at Gauguin altogether? And so, um, you know, my my editor, his headline was sort of basically just taking that and rewording it, really. Is it time Gauguin got cancelled? Um, and of course, that was a rhetorical question. Uh, but as you say, Craig, uh, I kind of, <laughs> I kind of got, um, I don't know if I got cancelled, but I got in trouble or, or I was criticized by by um, certain, yeah, the French media. I mean, there were some French publications that didn't read the story. It really was very clear that they hadn't really read the story because they, you know, went on and on about how the New York Times was asking for Gauguin to get canceled when, in fact, the story was just basically exploring the various, um, the, the, the various new perspectives on this artist and how we should look at him today in the sort of post-Weinstein era. Um, and, you know, the reason the, the what the conclusion that I guess I came to having spoken to uh, many, many museum directors, most of them female and art historians and curators who know the work of Gauguin very well and have shown him on numerous occasions um, is that we, you know, Gauguin, you know, he lived with on two occasions. Uh, he married a uh, quote unquote, according to the local Tahitian custom, two 13 or 14 year old girls. So these were on separate occasions, obviously. And Gauguin, this is, you know, late 19th century, early 20th, Gauguin was himself already married. He was married to a Danish woman, met Gauguin, and they have five, uh, they had five children. So there were all kinds of problems with his behavior. Not only was he, you know, in, you know, technically committing an act of pedophilia, but also he was act also being polygamous. I mean, there are all kinds of problems with this. And over the years, you know, all of us have seen beautiful Gauguin exhibitions. And to this day, I, I love his paintings. I, you know, I'm mesmerized by them. I, I find them beautiful. And, you know, my attraction for Gauguin's art has not diminished even after, you know, writing this book and talking to these uh, various people. But what these people are saying and what these women say is, no, we're not asking for Gauguin paintings to be torn down walls and for the Musée d'Orsay to, to be emptied of his Gauguins, for instance. We're just saying, um, let's show Gauguin, but let's also talk about this personal side of him, which has been completely... Um, shunned and sort of swept under the carpet and ignored. Let's stop ignoring the personal side of Gauguin and let's talk about Gauguin the man. That's what people are saying. And, you know, I feel like there's, uh, again, a, sort of a comparative culture aspect to to the discussion, which, you know, you, you have a unique perspective on giving, you know, growing up in France and being in the U.S. And, you know, it kind of plays into this um, you know, French view of cancel culture versus Americans' um, proclivity to that. And my my wife teaches French. Uh, she lived in France um, for a while, and you uh -huh. know she she lived in France during the Clinton impeachment. And people yeah. would come to her and say, you know, what what is the, what what are you Americans? What, what are you even doing? Why why are you why do you care who your president sleeps with? That's that's not his job, right? So there right. seems, mm -hmm. you know, culturally, can you kind of speak to just a different cultural perspective of how f the French are able to separate who a person is versus what a person does? 
Okay, I mean, I think that that has changed a great deal and that the the um, stereotypes about France uh, all need revisiting because France is changing and changing very rapidly. Uh, when you listen to the political campaigns, uh, they talk constantly about, like, the right-wing parties will complain about how uh, everybody is so woke and everyone's being politically correct. And there's even a term called le wokeisme, you know, I mean, there's all these accusations flying that universities in France are just, you know, being too politically correct and we're paying too much attention to minorities and all of this sort of stuff. But uh, when you actually look at what's happening, um, you see a great deal of shifts and a great deal of changes and you see evolutions along the lines of what's happening in America. And uh, here's some examples I discovered recently that uh, this town in Brittany where Gauguin lived um, and where, you know, there, there's a mural of him, you know, on, on the side of a, a building. That mural had been covered with slogans, angry slogans by feminist groups. And that when they, you know, wiped off the slogan, another slogan was put back on, that there's complaints about this character uh, and they don't want him to be associated with that town. When you look at the um, heads of some of the French uh, national museums, major museums in Paris, you are seeing uh, people who are non-white taking over. And um, if you look at who France has uh, chosen to represent it at this year's Venice Biennale, where every country, as you know, or most countries have a pavilion, and that pavilion is supposed to reflect the nation, well, this year's, um, this year's artist is Zineb Sadira, who's French-Algerian. So, I mean, this is official France um, choosing Zineb Sadira, who's um, of Algerian descent, to represent it. So this, this kind of, the whole issue, of, and also, uh, you know, the, the issue of Me Too and, and women and, and um, what we heard in the very beginning of the Me Too scandal, which were a, a few famous voices saying, you know, why shouldn't men have right to flirt, the right to flirt? I think all of that has been now uh, revised and and you know you have very very vocal uh, young French actresses who have stood up and and uh, basically spoken of sexual assault or experiences of rape and uh, and they have um, protested very very loudly against you know uh, the filmmaker Roman Polanski uh, and there are other examples so I think France is is changing or has changed quite a bit. In another part of the book, when we were talking about underrepresentation in minorities in museum staff, you uh, you referenced this term I hadn't seen before, which was universality, and you know I guess right. it, it, which is the sense that since egalité is a cornerstone of French culture, there's no need to actually track equality, but you know that doesn't yeah. that doesn't seem to actually reflect opportunities for for those colonial immigrant minorities can you tell me more uh, about that precept because i'm that's the first time i had I'd seen reference to that i mean you know as you know the french revolution uh you know uh, generated this motto liberté égalité fraternité and as, as you all know and so the principle behind that is everybody is, is equal and every we were all born equal and there's no difference between uh, one French citizen and another. And there's also this very, very staunch tradition of secularity and secularism in France. There's a very, very, um, very stark separation of church and state, which means that, therefore, um, if everybody's equal, we can't define people according to uh, their uh, ethnic origin or their ethnicity, because everybody's equal. And we certainly can't define them according to their religion. So France doesn't actually, you know, have official statistics breaking down the population according to how many are of North African origin and how many are this or that. There are, of course, those kinds of statistics, but they're more kind of informal. And so what that translates into or what that has translated into over the decades is that in the museum world, you know, people were just recruited and there was no attention paid to the fact that we also need to recruit people from you know, categories, uh, minorities, uh, or ethnicities that will make our museums more open-minded and more alert to what's going on in the real world. 
And, you know, for a very long time, the French just, you know, they just didn't pay attention to that. And whenever it was brought up, people would say, oh, yeah, that's kind of American style political correctness. And, oh, yeah, and that's just so PC. But as I was explaining to you earlier, um, in, in reality, all of that's happening quite a bit. I go to museums all the time. Uh, and I see, you know, um, that the press office or this or that department actually is led by or has, you know, people from, um, you know, who, who have North African sounding names or who have names that, that don't sound like they, they are European French. Uh, so, so this is a, an actually a, a process that is now uh, in place and that, you know, I think that even without kind of having quotas, even without, you know, counting people up, I think the French are really um, waking up to this necessity. The conversation about underrepresentation is is probably a nice segue to talk about how the environment for opportunities for African Americans is changing. I mean, I I see it in terms of just seeing uh, what museum programming looks like, what gallery programming looks like. I know that um, I I have really struggled. I I want a diverse (laughs) group of guests on this podcast, and uh, I'm having problems booking African-American artists because I get lots and lots of polite responses that I'm way too busy basically making hay while the sun is shining, right? And I guess you know there there right. is a there is a rhetorical question that you you had in in the book, which is, uh, are we witnessing a true revolution this time, an irreversible shift towards the representation of minorities in the art world? Is in other words, are we seeing a, a, a correction during a new cycle that w- when something dies down, it will go back to the old uh, status quo, or? Or are we seeing uh, a lasting change? What is your impression based on the people you've been talking to? I mean, my impression, which I, I lay out in the epilogue, is that this is not a flash in the pan. Uh, it cannot be a flash in the pan. I mean, how could we, after you know, um, putting on exhibitions in major museums of major African-American, let's say, artists, how could we then go back to, and, and doing so, over a number of years, we, this is now a, a process that has started, and you know, in the last three, four, five years, to be very, very visible, and it is very, very visible. I mean, um, as you know, as you as you were just pointing out, and how are we going to then suddenly shut the doors on African American artists, let's say, and go back to only showing Cezanne, you know, Jackson Pollock, Gauguin, you know, uh, Matisse. And uh, you know what I'm saying? I mean, and David Hockney, it's just, um, it's just, it, it's just for me, it's just inconceivable. Uh, especially since a museum such as MoMA, which is pretty much the, you know, three-dimensional art history book, uh, has decided to rehang its collection, and in that rehang has brought uh, brought out a lot of um, artists who were overshadowed and overlooked for decades many of them women and many of them artists who are non-white. And, uh, and they're now, you know, they're now in the MoMA rehang and, um, you know, in one of the most striking juxtapositions, uh, Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon is hanging on a wall near uh, Faith Ringgold's uh, American People Number 20 Die. Um, it, it's, uh, that's pretty striking. That's a striking uh Vision, and that's also pretty much a, a kind of harbinger of of what lies ahead. I mean, I really don't see MoMA, which sets the tone in so many ways, then going back to putting Faith Ringgold somewhere where she's not visible, and just sticking Picasso next to Cezanne again. You know, it's uh, yeah. I mean, it's just things have gone too far, I think, and in, in, in a good way. Yeah, and so that's. I mean, we're we're on this new trajectory. Sure. Well, you know, I heard a conversation uh, this past week um, about American professional football that it seemed to, to be parallel to, to this conversation about museums and that in the National Football League, 80% of the players are African-American, but only 3% of the teams 
have an African American head coach, and no, none of the teams have um, you know a top executive that's African American, and none of the owners are African American. And it made me start thinking about right. the the museums and how is part of the underrepresentation you know that we historically have seen in museums because we have a lack of African-American curators, uh, African-American museum directors, and boards that don't represent that diversity. Yeah, absolutely. No, that is absolutely correct. And I think that one of the, one of the um, uh, curators I quote, uh, she's, a, she's an academic, a curator, and an artist, is Coco Fusco. And she says it very clearly. She says, until we see Black Black men and women individuals on boards running museums, and until we see, you know, works by black artists acquired en masse to enter the collections of those museums, this change is, you know what I mean? It's going to be kind of cosmetic. Um, you know, it, she said it's all well and good to put exhibitions of African American artists on, but for real change, you really do need to see, um, yeah, exactly what you said, Craig, which is you know, the, the chiefs, the, you know, the board members, museum directors, the curators, you just really do need to see change, um, you know, trickling through all of those categories. Sure. And I, you know, I wrote down this quote and I, it may have been uh, Coco Fusco who, who yeah. quoted in your book, but I thought it was really interesting. A quote said, uh, you're not changing things by being another room full of white people deciding what people of color want to get or experience. I think that was coming from uh, that was coming from one of the social media feeds where people um, complain uh, sort of it's called cancel art galleries, I think, or cancel oh, right, or right. change the museum. I think it came from there. And it's an anonymous. It's one of it's some of these anonymous comments that people put up on these Instagram feeds. Continuing down the, the path of underrepresentation, yeah. the underrepresentation of women dorically in collections and just the washing away of female contributions over the history of the art canon is something else you, you talk about in the book. And I think you, you kind of phrase it this way in the book that consciously we know that women are underrepresented. But when you start looking at the data, it's kind of shocking just how underrepresented. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, I I have this art history book that everyone possibly who's interested in art has a copy of. It's called The Story of Art, and it's by Ernst Gombrich, the very famous, you know, British art historian. And I worshipped this book when I was, you know, in my teens and I wanted to find out about art. I would read it into the night and just look at the pictures and just the, the images and just be completely blown away. And then I, I when I started writing the book, I started flicking through the index, looking for um, uh, female artists, and there wasn't a single one, even though he actually updated the book in the 1980s. So he did have a chance, you know, to incorporate some female artists in the 1980s when he did the final edition, and there was still not a single female artist anywhere. And this is just, I think, emblematic of the kind of erasure that women suffered um, all the way through the 20th century, by the way. Uh, and, and, you know, I explain that in the book. Uh, there is kind of reason for it, but it, it, it is shocking. And when you look at the stats, Charlotte Burns and Julia Halperin did these, this report where they went around 30 major museums in America, and they looked at the, num the sort of ratio of uh, art by women that they exhibited and acquired. And it was like, you know, one in 10 or, or less works were by uh, women. I mean, it, the statistics are, they're pretty staggering. They're staggeringly low. You know, one, one of the things that um, just seems so paradoxical when, when I think about, uh, about that is when you look at, for example, when you look at the enrollment at the Art Institute of Chicago. Yeah. The Art Institute of Chicago has 3,200 students, 800 of them are male, 2,300 of them are female. And it's like, you know, it's three to one female to male, but you know, when you look at, you know, what's being represented on the walls of, of the museums, 
it's, you know, just so far from that. And I, I think historically there's been a narrative that I think you, you titled that chapter just not good enough. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, which was really a false narrative. I right? mean, th- these titles are in jest, uh, as you know. I mean, in these, I'm not saying that women are not good enough. Yeah. These, these are kind of, yeah, funny. Yeah. Yeah. It, but, you know, that that comes from something that uh, a male patriarchy would have would have said, you know, within our lifetime. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I I think you even have an example in there where, you know, a museum director is like, well, I, or I think it may have been a biennial um, curator said, well, I would have included, um, you know, more females. But I just. No, I mean, I think I think um. No, I mean I think you're referring to the uh, the um, the gallerist who um, who said why are there not um, enough uh, why why are there not any great women artists? He he was this gallerist and he went up to uh, Linda Nochlin at a graduation ceremony and he said to Nin- Linda Nochlin why are there not any great women artists? And Linda Nochlin turned that into the title of a very very famous essay that she wrote. I think in 1970, early 1970s, in which she said, she said, yes, you know, it's true that there are no extraordinary, extraordinary prodigies like Picasso or Leonardo or Michelangelo who were women, but the here's why. And then she went into, you know, explaining the kind of status that women had and the, the circumstances that were forced upon them for millennia, basically, that made it absolutely impossible to have an art practice and to focus and to be able to do your art and show your art and be recognized for it. Yeah. I mean, mainly circumstances that boil down to uh, childbirth, child care, marriage, household care, all of these things. So all of those domestic kind of duties that prevented women artists from, you know, actually being properly active. I don't know if you set out to do this, but you know this this conversation, what or what you've written in this book, just really seems like a primer for people that are going into you know, museum studies or even artists to understand, mm-hmm. you know, in their twenties w- what they're walking into. Have you heard feedback that this might be used as uh, an added text to some of those reading lists for for graduate schools because it certainly seems to really boil down uh, the landscape of uh, of the world we're looking at well thank you craig yes i have uh, I, yesterday i was addressing a group of students at the university of tennessee via zoom obviously and uh yeah i mean there are other uh sort of um universities that are being um you know university alumni clubs i think the Colum- columbia alumni club is uh looking to organize possible talk with me. So yeah, it, it is something that will, um, that could serve that that particular community, uh, the community of students and of academia. And I'm very, very pleased about that. Uh, but I think this book has a lot of different, um, you know, possible readers. I've had people come up to me who read it, who were in their 20s and who are not connected to art or not experts. And they found it readable uh, and and not pretentious or whatever which is a relief. And, uh, and then there are people who are, you know, some of the world's greatest curators and they read it and they, they find something in it. So in other words, it's not, I mean, I've tried not to make it too much of a niche product, too much of a, of a niche uh, publication that only certain people would want to read. I really did intend this as, as a mainstream publication. And I really do hope that it will have uh, a kind of a, a broader readership, if that's possible. So, if if folks wanted to uh, to keep track of you, they obviously can buy the book, take down Art and Power in the Digital Age. There's also Absolutely. the podcast Culture Blast, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, Everywhere, yeah. You, mm-hmm. And uh, website is it is it Farinayeri dot com? Is that, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, Exactly. Right. Oh, great. We're three for three. And um, possibly uh, they may even catch you uh, playing a piano uh, performance someplace. Some, you know, you're, <laughs> you're, so you, you're, you're, you're a classically trained pianist. And how often do you, do you perform? Not often at all, Craig. <laughs> I perform a number, number of years ago and um, 
and I haven't performed since because I'm I d- didn't want to make piano my profession. Although the, the question did come up when I was in my teens, I had an extraordinary professor, Sylvie Albert, and um, and she asked me if I wanted to make this my profession, and I said I didn't because by then I decided I wanted to be a journalist. I I was very excited by journalism, uh, you know, from the age of about ten or eleven, and um, yeah, and I and I do love writing, and I love you know, I loved writing this book and I, and I'm happy to have chosen this particular trajectory, but music is a very, very important part of my life. And, um, yeah, I, I, I am definitely also a musician. So one, one last question is your job title gives you the opportunity to talk to all types of artists all over the world. What is your most memorable experience getting to, to meet one of these creators so Craig, I mean, I, I don't, it, you know, the artists that I interview, they're a bit like my children in, in, in some way. <laughs> These stories are, are, uh, are like babies. And, and I, I really adore, I mean, I sincerely have deep appreciation for all of the artists that I interview and I'm not being polite. I really do have an incredible admiration for all of them and uh and affection also for some of them but there is one who i'd like to bring up and and she's a she's a, she was an artist artist as much as an architect uh and because she's passed away and she's someone i was I, I grew reasonably close to or grew to get to know uh is zaha hadid the, the late iraqi born architect uh she she was an extraordinary woman she was the the world's most famous um woman architect, uh, and still is, by the way, and no one has really surpassed her. And uh, she was also the first woman ever to win the Pritzker Architecture Prize. And, you know, I had a very memorable interview with her. Uh, She never really let people in, but maybe because I was from Iran, she felt that I wasn't maybe going to misrepresent her. And I had a a memorable interview in, um, in her apartment in London, where we were sitting at a at a curvy table that she had designed and there were vases of her design and she was sitting under a skylight and in front of a painting of her, her that she had done. And yeah, that was just, um, in which she kind of really told me the story of her life, starting in Baghdad and working her way all the way up to the present. And yeah, I will always remember that. I took a picture of her, uh, that I treasure and, uh, yeah, that will be definitely one of the memorable ones. Absolutely. Well, she she was uh, incomparable, and um, it was a shock uh, to learn of her passing, and uh, exactly. it was a real loss for for the art and architecture space both. I mean, her uh, her work was you know truly visionary, and so absolutely but, exactly. Uh, Farah, I I can't thank you enough for your time uh, today. My um, pleasure. I, Great. I I feel I feel I feel like I could uh, I could keep on talking about th- these things for for another hour. But, uh, you know, I, I really uh, do uh, appreciate your time and hopefully, you know, our conversation has been um, informative and uh, enough that uh, folks are encouraged to go out and read the book and buy a, an extra copy to, to give to a friend. And so. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to ArtSense. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. If you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read a transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at canvia.art. Thanks for listening.